Um, I'm Neil Collar, one of the partners in the planning team at Brodie's. Um, my colleagues, um, George and Arlene, um, will also be contributing. Um, and uh, what we've done today is we've put together a mixture of cases um, just so that we can um, find something for everyone, hopefully. Um, so we've not necessarily covered all the really big ones or all the really, really important ones. And there are some um, which uh, are maybe a bit more of niche interest, but we thought um, uh, sometimes the niche interest ones are the ones that people haven't heard of that turned out to be the more interesting. So um, uh, the first one I wanted to touch on um, is definitely not a niche and is extremely well known, um, and that's the Marks and Spencers case. Um, Oxford Street, London, um, and um, in some ways, uh, I, I thought this could be subtitled Michael Gove against the rest of the world, but that would be a little unfair in Michael Gove. But the point is, um, this is uh, a planning permission where uh, the planning officers at the council recommended approval. The council were minded to grant approval it was notified to, to Michael Gove. He decided to call it in. His inspector recommended approval, but Michael Gove decided to refuse the permission. Um, so that's why, slightly frivolously, I'm saying it's Michael Gove against the rest of the world. And following on from the court decision, he may still feel that the world is against him. Um, in terms of what the court decided, um, there's nothing particularly new in terms of the principles they're applying. And in some ways, the most interesting thing is really how this case has been um, discussed in the property press, newspapers and so on. Um, because uh, perhaps understandably, um, the important point that a lot of commentators haven't picked up is the court has quashed the decision to refuse the permission. That's only the first step. Marks and Spencers have not won. They've won the first step. What now happens is um, the planning application revives and Michael Gove has to re-decide it. And uh, depending on um, his wriggle room, as it were, um, in terms of addressing the concerns that, that the court uh, flagged up, which I'm going to go on to, Michael Gove may actually reach the same decision. Um, so it's not a done deal in any way. Um, there's still quite a lot of, of um, ground to cover. Um, in terms of what the court decided, um, it is a, quite a lengthy judgment. And what I've tried to do here is to refine it into um, just the key aspects. And really, it boils down to two legal principles. The first one is... Interpreting planning policy is a legal issue. So the court will intervene. Um, uh, there's a slight exception where the policy involves an element of judgment. That element of judgment, the court won't intervene with in, in um, common with the approach they always take. But just the basic point about what does the policy say, that is a legal issue. And that was the first situation where Michael Gove went wrong. And as I've set out on the slide, the MPPF, uh, Michael Gove's decision said, there's a strong presumption in favour of repurposing and reusing buildings. And the court said, no, there isn't. Um, they would uh, put up with a certain element of putting a gloss on it putting it in slightly different terms, but they felt um, there was no way of interpreting it to be able to say there was a strong presumption. And interestingly, one of the things they noticed in, noted in passing was there is an express presumption in other parts of the MPPF. So there was a feeling if the MPF had meant to have a strong presumption on this, it would have said so. It didn't. Um, so that didn't help Michael Gove's case. Um, the second interpretation there are, uh, was um, the London plan, um, where uh, the court said Michael Gove's decision um, confused uh, operational carbon and embedded carbon. 
the point being the requirement for carbon offsetting in the London plan only applies to operational carbon. So again, got off on the wrong foot. And when you've got off on the wrong foot, you can never get back on the right foot because the court is just not sure um, uh, whether you've got completely off track. And sorry, I'm beginning to mix metaphors there. Um, so that's the interpretation point. The second main theme was the giving of reasons. And, and this is an interesting one because um, sometimes when I'm looking at cases and I see there's a challenge to reasons, I think, hmm, this isn't a particularly strong challenge because the courts generally um, give a bit of latitude and they're not keen on quashing decisions on the basis of problems with reasons. On this one, though, as I've set out in the slide, the court found um, that the Secretary of State's reasons were insufficient on um, three aspects uh, within the issues of the case, and it's set out in the slide, and I'm, I'm not going to go through them. Um, but um, he didn't lose on everything. Um, the court did say, in terms of the impact on setting, the reasons were sufficient. Um, so, court quashed the permission. Um, we'll wait and see what happens in a redecision. Um, and then the next one I wanted to touch on uh, is a Scottish one. Um, I actually blogged on it, so if anyone wants to see more information on this if you go onto our blog um, you'll see commenting in a bit more detail and there's a link to the actual judgment a uh, similar point to the mns one um, the issue was legal interpretation um, on this occasion the scottish national planning policy for um, and in particular uh, biodiversity um, and the challenge was brought by a wildcat haven. The issue was not surprisingly about wildcats. And that is a photo of a wildcat. Um, it looks very much like a domestic cat, but that is actually one of the issues. Um, and um, the issue was the interpretation of the part of the policy that I set out in the second bullet point. Um, and in particular, uh, the requirement to mitigate in line with the mitigation hierarchy. Um, and the issue that the court had to grapple with was, in essence, how strictly do you need to follow the mitigation hierarchy? And what the court decided was it's not a prescriptive sequential test. So at the risk of paraphrasing and possibly falling into the trap Michael Goldfoyle into it, um, it's it, it it's not a situation where you well it's a situation where you need to satisfy it in the round um, rather than taking it very much step by step. Um, so it's quite interesting doing the compare and contrast with M and S. M and S, the decision maker, the Secretary of State got the interpretation wrong. In this one, um, the decision maker got it right. Um, this one. Did the court maybe take a, a little bit more of a sympathetic approach? Um, it's difficult to do the compare and contrast because the circumstances are different. Um, but it does show um, that interpretation isn't necessarily a straightforward issue. Um, the other thing to be aware of is, according to the press, this decision is now under appeal. Um, so it will, in due course, um, go to uh, the inner house of the court of session and we will get a decision about um, uh, whether this uh, outer house decision was correct and possibly a bit more clarification about the correct approach. So two interesting decisions on interpretation of policy. Um, I'm now going on to something completely different. As I said, we wanted to try and cover um, a good variety of issues um, and this is a decision about variation of conditions. And those of you who follow um, court decisions will be immediately thinking, oh, this is all about Finney case uh, and that issue, and you're correct. Um, and it's certainly something uh, that's causing a lot of angst um, out there in the planning practice. Um, and uh, this decision probably doesn't really help that because um, it 
continues to acknowledge that it's an awkward one to navigate round. If you're particularly interested in the topic, it's a great judgment to read because it goes through all the previous case law. Um, so it's a good one to get an overall um, description of uh, what each of the cases say and the judge reaches a bit of a conclusion. Um, it involved a planning permission for a solar farm and the description of the development included mention of an electricity substation. What happened, and I've simplified the planning history here, as always seems to be the case, there's quite a complicated planning history. Um, what happened was uh, the developer applied to vary the conditions to omit the substation. It was um, substituting plans and the new plans didn't show the substation. Challenged by an objector and the court said, um, there's actually a, a, a sort of um, two separate legal issues that come up um, about varying conditions and they referred to it as the first restriction and the second restriction. The bullet point deals with the first restriction, um, which is you can't vary the permission to introduce a condition which is in conflict or inconsistent with the operative wording of the existing planning permission. And you can see where this is going. The electricity substation was mentioned in the operative wording. It wasn't shown in the substituted plan. The condition, the varied condition referred to the substituted plan. So it failed that first restriction. The second restriction, which um, I didn't put up on the slide, um, is the fundamental alteration point. You can't vary a condition to fundamentally uh, alter the permission. Um, and it failed on that as well, not surprisingly. Um, so um, it really um, continues uh, the thrust uh, from the Finney case. Um, it clarifies the exact legal tests to be applied um, and it just illustrates the continuing problem if you're looking um, to whether it's value engineering or whatever reason for wanting to revisit the existing consent. Um, the good news, if you're in England and Wales, is that Lura um, contains a new provision uh, that you can apply to vary a planning permission. Um, so it's not just the condition, it's the permission itself. That's not in force yet, so it's a bit of a wait and see. Um, unfortunately, in Scotland, uh, that's not going to apply. Um, so the situation is going to be more awkward in Scotland to, to deal with us. Um, so I'm now going to pass over to George. Thanks, Neil. Um, and before I talk about this case, um, which is to do with a bit of sort of hillside judgment back in uh, 2022, um, the reason the Fisk case came about and the idea of replacing the substation was sort of an attempt to kind of avoid the implications of the hillside judgment. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of, that's why the segue from the Fisk case to this one, even though it seems a slightly different, um, different topic. Um, so the Dennis case, Dennis and, and London Borough of Southwark, um, this involved um, an outline planning permission or the equivalent of a planning permission in principle in Scotland um, for a quite large scale mixed use development um for in a, in a state in Southwark um and it was for resi employment um and retail space um in so that was granted in 2015 in 2022 um the new local plan introduced effectively um, increased housing targets which meant that the development couldn't um actually achieve those within the parameters of the outline planning permission so um the developer kind of submitted an application for a new detailed planning permission for one of the phases of the um, of the outline planning permission. Um, so this, for this purpose is for phase 2B. Um, so this then gave rise to the issue under the Pilkington principle, which I'm not going to go into detail of, but is was the subject of the Hillside case. Um, and effectively, because um, the if the, if the detailed permission for phase 2B was implemented, then the outline planning permission um, could no longer be built out because of the incompatibility test um, with phase 2B. 
so the council and the developer actually agreed um, that since the outline planning commission was for a phased development, um, phase 2B could be severed from the development, which would allow both the outline planning commission and the detailed planning commission to be built out. And that circumvented the Pilkington issue because um, for those of you aware, um, the hillside test said that um, it won't be a problem if the, um, or well, shouldn't be a problem if the planning commission is severable. Um, and so this was the, their way to kind of get around it. Um, and so in order to try and attempt to formalize that severability that they'd agreed upon, um, the developer made a section 96A application, so a non-material variation application, um, which the council approved, but that approval was then um, challenged. And the court basically said, um, firstly, uh, a fa phasing of a development or a phase development does not make it severable. Um, so prior to the section 96A, um, you couldn't uh, say that the um, application, the, the permission was severable. Otherwise, the fact effectively any phase development would then be um, getting around the hillside issue. Um, so that was a starting point. Um, and, and yet you can't then retrospectively through section 96A um, make it severable um, through that. So the the test that Hillside kind of put out for the severability is that there needs to be a, a clear contrary, uh, well, a, a, a permission isn't severable unless there is a clear and contrary indication um, that it should be. So um, I suppose it's just a, a pointer that the clearer you can be in terms of on your permission that it is severable would be the better, so that um, is a better chance of it kind of finding that uh, exception under Hillside. Um, but uh, with the the fist case coming forward and this case coming forward, kind of we're getting more cases now, uh, I suppose, that are arising out of that hillside judgment or following on from the hillside judgment, um, which is quite helpful because it's there's lots of question marks and clarifications required following that. So I suppose they're not bad for us as lawyers to help us on that. So um, as Neil said, completely changing topics around here. Um, the next is a uh, short term let, which I'm sure lots of you in Scotland are, um, are aware of. Um, but the first case I'm gonna look at is the Aberbuck and uh, City of Edinburgh Council case. This uh, related to the licensing side. So for those who aren't aware, um, from October 22, uh, short term lets, so your Airbnbs, your um, holiday cottages, etc. cetera, um, operators needed to obtain a license for their properties from the 1st of October 22. Uh, this has obviously been a uh, cause of a lot of frustration or kind of um, questions from operators. Uh, and we've certainly been inundated lots of questions about the licensing regime, uh, especially in Edinburgh, where there's the highest density of short term lets. So, as I said, this case, this case deals with the licensing um, policy that Edinburgh had. So, a rebuttable, the, the grounds of the policy that were, or parts of the policy that were challenged, involved um, a rebuttable presumption that a license wouldn't be granted for a secondary let, short term let, i.e. a property that's not a primary residence um, of the operator, um, where that secondary let was in a tenement building or otherwise in a building where there was a shared entrance door. Um, other areas were that licenses, that those licenses couldn't be granted for more than one year, whereas other licenses were allowed for three years. Um, the fact that short-term let licenses for secondary letting um, weren't able to be granted for temporary um, periods, which again was available to other types of letting. And then also um, a slightly unrelated requirement of uh, bedrooms, living rooms and hallways in secondary lets had to be covered with a suitable floor covering such as carpet or similar. So question what a suitable floor covering would be uh, if it's not one of those. But anyway, um, so the challenge um, succeeded on all but the ground around limiting the secondary license to one year. Um, so the absence of temporary licensing um, and also the point about floor coverings was unlawful. But the key takeaway from this case was around that rebuttable presumption against licenses for secondary let. Um, and it was more kind of 
a helpful reminder for us as to the, the extent of the regimes. So firstly, Lord Braid said that while there could always be exceptions from a policy, um, it was clear that City of Edinburgh Council um, in fact granted licenses for short-term lets in tenement accommodation more than exceptionally, either it was sort of, it was close to a, a ban, I suppose. Um, and he helpfully confirmed kind of the, the complementary nature and distinction between licensing and planning regimes. Um, so licensing is to do with how the short-term lets were to be run or operated um, and it wasn't to be concerned with whether the short-term let use should be there in the first place. So that was um, that was an issue for the planning regime, so questions of immunity and whether it was acceptable. Um, and so yes, licensing shouldn't be dealing with, is this use acceptable in this location? It should be, um, especially if there is planning in place, it should be, okay, how can this be operated in a suitable way so as to not impact on immunity. So the council could still refuse a license application on immunity grounds, but they couldn't have a policy to refuse a license simply on the basis that the property was in a tenement or had a shed door, um, which is effectively um, what the council's policy was held to do. Um, just to caveat, this case has been seen by uh, lots of short-term lit operators as perhaps a silver bullet to their licensing applications to suggest that they can then they should now be approved um but it's not quite the case i mean it it makes it perhaps easier to obtain a license in a tenement um for a short for a secondary short-term let um but the tricky matter um that still needs to be established is the planning status of the property and whether it is acceptable and so that's where our next case takes us, um, so what's to do with planning, it's not quite the um, direct correlation, but um, so this case, Muirhead and City of Edinburgh Council, again, um, it was a judgment from December last year, so relatively recent, although it's now March, so maybe not. Um, so the case related Edinburgh's short-term let control order, which had designated the whole of Edinburgh as a short-term let control area under the Planning Act 2019, um, so the control area came into effect on the 5th of September 2022. The effect, as some of you will know, of a control area is that any change of use from a residential to a secondary let, i.e. not a first home um, short-term let, constituted a material change of use, um, and that was by the uh, introduction of Section 26B of the Town and Country Planning Scotland Act 1997. Um, so the, the key question that the court was asked effectively was, um, did the control area have retrospective effect? Um, so the guidance of business that issued by the council effectively stated that it was retrospective. So any short term let, whether commenced before or after the 5th of September 22, required to either have planning permission, have a pending application for planning permission, for short term let or a certificate of lawfulness confirming 10 years of continuous use. Um, the relevant planning reference was then required on the, the licensing application form. Um, but Lord Braid, again, same judge um, as the licensing question, um, held that the Section 26B um, deems that a change of use of, um, was to be material. It doesn't deem that a change of use to short term let was material. So there effectively it pointed out that section 26 b required a change to actually happen in order for it to be constituted as material. Um, so where a change of use from a dwelling to a short term let had been had occurred um, by planning permission or without planning permission um, prior to the 5th of September, it meant that on the 5th of September, that property was um, a short-term let now um, and therefore wasn't a dwelling house and therefore there couldn't be a change of use from dwelling house to short-term let after that event and he looked to the laws of retrospectivity and um, and I think effectively one of the arguments was if the because there was such a significant effect of it if it did have retrospective effect 
then the government would have made it more explicit that it did have a retrospective effect rather than it being presumed. Um, so again, we, we've had lots of inquiries about following this case, kind of does this change the position, but it, it more just clarifies that, um, and again, it's not a silver bullet, but it kind of helps us clarify that if there was a change of use prior to the 5th of September, it now means that you may not have required planning permission, or you may not now require planning permission. Um, whereas the previous position was that um, it did require planning permission because of 26B, the council argued being retrospective. Um, but yes, we would we would clarify when I said may not, because it still is a matter of was the change of use prior to um, 5th of September 2022 a material change? Um, and if it was, then it would have required planning permission. It's just whether you can uh whether in the specific circumstances the change was immaterial would mean that there was an admission wasn't required and uh, on that note i'll pass to arlene thanks very much thanks george um, i'll be covering four cases with you this afternoon the first three have an enforcement focus and the last one takes us back to basics and reminds us of the guiding principles for decision making under the six uh, under section 25 of the 97 act um, the first case of Caldwell is an English High Court case which relates to the construction of a house in the Greenbelt on land which had permission for agricultural use. The house was substantially complete in 2014. The Planning Authority issued an enforcement notice in 2021 seeking, amongst other things, the cessation of the residential use of the land and demolition of the house. The case centred on whether it was excessive to require demolition of the house and not just cessation of its use, and whether the house could be considered ancillary to the change of use of land. So the question was, was the House immune from enforcement action or did its removal exceed what was required to remedy the breach of planning control? The court considered interpretation and scope of section 173 of the 1990 Act, and that's the restoration of the land to its condition before the breach took place, and how that interrelates to section 171b, which states that enforcement cannot be taken against operational development after the end of four years from the substantial completion of the building operations. A number of authorities have already considered this point of law previously, and most prominently is the Murfitt case. In Murfitt, the court held that an enforcement notice directed at the unauthorised material change of use may lawfully require the land or the building in question to be restored to its condition before that change of use took place, and that could be by the removal of associated works as well as cessation of the use itself. But that was provided that the works concerned were integral to or part and parcel of the unauthorised use. The court considered that this did not embrace operational development of a nature or scale which exceeded that. And this reflects section 173 as a remedial power. And the Murphy principle does not override the statutory scheme to which the four year and the 10 year time limit, which we're familiar with, apply. The claimant's case in Caldwell was that the Murphy principle had only been applied successfully in cases where the operational development which had to be removed was secondary, associated or not fundamental to the use which was subject to the enforcement notice. So it was claimed in this case that the enforcement notice could only require cessation of the house but not its removal. The court in fact agreed with the claimant, recognising that the starting point always has to be a statutory scheme and that operational development, such as the erection of a house, was immune from enforcement action four years after the substantial completion of the development. So what have we learned from Caldwell? We know that the Murphy principle has been applied in a variety of circumstances and it was confirmed in this case as being good law. What we also know is that its application is a question of um, fact and degree in the circumstances of each case. The court held that to extend the Murphy principle to operational development which gives rise to the unlawful use goes beyond the statutory scheme. So there's therefore a clear distinction between the enforcement of a physical building, which has a four year timescale, and the change of use, which has a 10 year timescale. Both statute and case law point to limitation in situations where the operational development is the source of or is fundamental to the change of use. So the, for, the court found in Caldwell that the inspector's decision on appeal was irrational, and he found that the removal of the dwelling house went beyond the statutory powers which had been conferred in him. The decision was therefore quashed. Um, it's important to note that this case is subject to further appeal, so it's one to watch to see if we have any um, change in law there. The next case is the case of Edwardson. Um, this is a case about land in Humby, East Lothian, um, which was being used as a racetrack. 
and it centred on whether the enforcement notice served by the Council was served within the time limits set out in Section 124 of the 97 Act. The enforcement notice was served by the Council on the 14th of October 2022 and required the demolition of the racetrack, fencing and signage and the cessation of use of land as a racetrack. It was alleged by the Council that planning control had been breached through the development of the racetrack and there was a change of use of land from agricultural to commercial. The enforcement notice was appealed to Scottish ministers on the basis that the racetrack was substantially complete on the 13th of October 2018. So that's four years and one day before the notice was served by the council. And it was therefore claimed that the notice was out of time. It was also argued that the change of use was in fact permitted development under class 15, as the land wasn't being used for a racetrack for more than 28 days in one year and it in fact reverted to agricultural use between the motocross events. It was also argued that the fences were erected under Class 7 of the PD. On appeal, the porter agreed and quashed the enforcement notice, but this decision was appealed under Section 238 by a neighbour of the farm on the basis that the reporter hadn't properly considered the evidence showing that the development was not substantially complete by the 13th of October, and in fact the land hadn't reverted to agricultural use. So what do we learn from Edwardson? Um, it reaffirms that the burden of proof is on the appellant to demonstrate that a notice has been served out of time and it's them that must establish the facts to support the case. It restated Justice Widgery in the Nelsonville case where he stated that there's no hardship in imposing that burden on the appellant because they will know precisely when that development occurred. It also restated um, familiar principles, the wordy test, whereby in weighing up all the evidence, all relevant considerations must be taken into account and not irrelevant ones. And the West Lothian case, where a decision notice must identify all the live issues and be framed in a manner which leaves the reader in no doubt as to the reasons for the decisions and what considerations were taken into account. So in Edwardson, the court held that the decision note of the decision notice of the reporter had been framed in the negative, whereby he stated there was no evidence to, um, to demonstrate that the development was not substantially complete more than four years before the notice was served. The court considered, considered this approach to be erroneous and stated that it was essential to establish the exact date when the development was substantially complete. So what do we mean by substantially complete? Um, the, the court referred to Annex A of Circular 10 of 2009, and in particular Paragraph 6 for guidance, and stated that it is a matter of fact and degree and of the prevailing circumstances of any case as to when a development is substantially complete. The court held that a holistic approach should be taken, and that follows the decision in SAGE, which means that a lesser operation might have been carried out without permission, or where an operation was started outside the four year period, but not substantially complete, that the notice may nevertheless require the removal of all the works, including any ancillary works. The fact that some works can be completed as um, under permitted development rights does not affect the holistic approach in determining whether a development is substantially complete or not. The court therefore concluded that the fencing was integral to the development of the racetrack and the fact that it could have been erected under PDR did not alter that fact. The second issue in that case was regarding the change of use of land. Um, the court concluded that there was no evidence to demonstrate that the land had been used as a racetrack continuously for 10 years, or that the racetrack had been dismantled at the end of each event, and found that the conclusions of the reporter could therefore not be understood. The court held that the reporter had misdirected themselves when determining that the development had been substantially complete before the 13th of October. So the appeal was upheld and remitted back to the Scottish Ministers for reconsideration. Um, the next case, um, I mentioned this one briefly because it's actually a rare example of a reported decision relating to the enforcement of a planning obligation. In this case, a Section 75 agree agreement had been modified to enable an affordable housing commuted sum to be paid in instalments. The value of the sum was to be calculated by the district valuer according to the market value of a housing unit. Upon receiving an invoice for payment from the council, the defender disputed the value of the sums to be paid and argued that the DV's methodology was unsound and significantly inflated the commuted sum to be paid. They sought further modification of the Section 75 agreement and following refusal by the planning authority, appealed to Scottish ministers under Section 75B. That appeal was ultimately dismissed. Um, this case highlights the use of Section 237 of the 97 Act relating to the validity of a determination by Scottish ministers 
Now that section states that determinations um, by Scottish ministers cannot be questioned in legal proceedings. The defender continued to refuse, uh, refuse to pay the commuted sum and the authority raised proceedings in the sheriff court. So the question at issue in this case was whether the defences lodged by the defender was an attempt to revisit the decision of the Scottish ministers contrary to section 237. In this case, the court held that they did, and because the matter had already been considered by the reporter on the appeal, it was incapable of being questioned further in the Sheriff Court. It also serves as a reminder that where parties to an agreement agree to be bound by an expert's opinion, then that decision is final and binding unless the ex expert is guilty of fraud or manifest error, or they've materially departed from their instructions or gone beyond the limits of the decision-making authority which has been bestowed on them in the agreement. The court held that there was nothing of the rule or the report of the DV um, which supported the defender's position. Um, and finally, I thought it would be nice to round up today's session with a case law update, um, with this case, um, Bruce against Murray Council. Um, not only does it serve as a reminder that, although it's rare, local review body decisions are challenged in the courts, but it also helpfully sets out the back to basic guiding principles which must be applied when making planning decisions. Um, this case also covers the statutory provisions relating to the modification and adoption of the proposed local development plan, although we don't have time to cover that um, particular aspect of the case today. This case relates to an application for residential development on a site which was allocated for housing in the Council's pr proposed local development plan. However, before the application was determined, the reporter examining the proposed plan removed the housing allocation and instead designated the land with an ENV Green Corridor designation. The court proceeded to adopt, uh, the council proceeded to adopt the plan, sorry, before the application was determined. The application was refused on the basis that it did not comply with the local development plan and there was no material considerations to justify a departure. The applicant um, submitted a review to the council's local review body. Um, the LRB considered the review and determined that, um, in fact, planning permission should be granted. The reason given by the LRB that it was an acceptable departure to the plan because there was community benefit in terms of housing and an increase in the school role. The relevant policy of the local development plan, though, stated that the only exceptions to the presumption against development on ENV land was for the development of essential community infrastructure, and it specifically included the development of housing. So this case reminds us that Section 25 of the Act permits a departure from the development plan, but only if material considerations so indicate. It restated the wordy test, as we've covered earlier, um, which means that the informed reader should be in no real and substantial doubt as to what the reasons for a decision are. Judgment also quoted Lord Justice Hinkinbottom um, from the case R. Bates, in which he stated that when a decision maker is reviewing the decision of another, they should grasp the intellectual nettle of the disagreement. It also restated um, existing principles in Edinburgh, um, City of Edinburgh Council case in relation to giving reasons and the Aberdeenshire Council case of 2008 in respect of material considerations. So the question in this case was, did the reasons given by the LRB constitute material considerations? You'll recall that they were stated as being um, an increase in housing and to the school role. The court took the view in this case that when they were exp expressed cumulatively, as was in the decision notice, if one part of the reason was wrong, then there must be an overall error. It was found that the school role was to increase by only three pupils as a result of the proposed development, and the court concluded that this could not be characterised as material. On the issue of housing, um, as this was expressly excluded in the policy relating to the development of ENV land, the court concluded that this couldn't be a material consideration either. So overall, the court concluded that the local review body had erred in law, that its decision was ultra vires and was therefore quashed. And that brings me to the end of my presentation today. I'll hand back over to you, Neil. Thanks very much. Um, and uh, I must have put people off asking questions because we don't have any questions, but um, you know where we are. Our contact details are at the end. You get the contact details on the website. Um, I just wanted to um, make a few concluding remarks. Um, we covered a lot of ground there, um, and it does show the width of planning, how 
um, we've jumped from solar developments to short-term holiday lets and on and on and on, um, and picking up an enforcement as well. Um, but I'm rising to the challenge of finding a few unifying remarks just to conclude. Um, and um, the first thing I suppose to say is um, we've always um, said that there are a huge amount of successful legal challenges in planning. The cases we've covered today show um, that um, there are some successful challenges out there. Um, m and as a developer were successful in challenging. Um, some of the other ones were challenges bought, brought by objectors. Um, but it is still going to be difficult to persuade judges to intervene in a planning decision and, and to quash that decision. Um, the key message in terms of uh, the cases we've been looking at uh, is really the need for the decision maker to focus on the basics. Firstly, you've got to get the law right, interpret the law correctly. The second one is um, you've got to get the policy right, interpretation again, that's M&S um, and the Wildcat Haven one. And then um, you've got to give sufficient reasons um, to explain your decision. It may well be the right decision, but if you haven't explained it um, in enough detail, uh, there is a risk there that the, that the courts will wash it. But to be fair to decision makers, um, the basics aren't necessarily basic in every case. And that's the problem. Um, you know, picking up at random, um, Arlene mentioned there the substantially complete, um, I think it is test and enforcement. Well, it's going to depend on the circumstances, how you actually interpret and apply that. Um, and that is one of the problems that we all come across. Um, it is difficult to decide in individual cases how to apply the basics and get it right. Um, and that will continue to generate um, uh, these sorts of legal challenges and the court is going to have to continue to grapple with it. Um, so um, thank you um, for... I'll just, uh, I'll just quickly jump in, Neil. So we, you, your challenge, to, we haven't had any questions, has triggered two questions. Um, one, I think we could probably answer is, is, is the FIS case likely to encourage use of less specific or detailed description development and what are the pitfalls associated with that? I mean, I think off the back of Finney, I think we're, people are already lining up to bring a classic example like Finney of wind turbines. You're not going to put the height of the turbine in the description anymore. Um, similarly, with housing developments, you, after Finney, you're not going to put the specific number. Um, and we're dealing with one at the moment where there's a specific number. Um, where you can have that like, approximately would be helpful or up to is I suppose to yes. some degree but yeah I think <laughs> you're always always gonna we're already kind of seeing that I think this just kind of is a clarification of, of Finney I suppose um, but yes and I suppose there's only so far you can go with making them less specific and less detailed um, but yeah you can't you can't push it too much but yeah. yes agreed and um... There's a bit more background to that in a blog I did um, on description of development, um, and, and that's worth a look, just picking up on those sorts of points. But the difficulty for practitioners is um, it, it's one of those being asked the impossible, make the permission as flexible as possible to make it as easy as possible for me to change it in the future, despite the fact I can't tell you necessarily what I might want to change in the future. Um, and it's sort of gee thanks. <laughs> you, want, you want me to um, uh, be able to look uh, into the future, figure everything out, and then come back to the present and make sure that it will all be fine. It, it, it's just not going to happen. So as you said, there are easier ones, such as the height of wind turbines, where it's easier to predict, yes, that's something that might need changed. We can grapple with that. Others, um, we're back to the uh, Donald Rumsfeld one that I like about no knowns, no unknowns, and unknown unknowns. <laughs> and there's a lot of that in, in, in that topic. So, um, yeah, good question. Thank you for that one. That's grand. Good. Well, thank you all. Um, that takes us very neatly, ever so slightly past our time. So, um, thank you all for 
um, tuning in or whatever we call it when you you uh, join the webinar um, and um, uh, um, good luck with grappling with all of these uh, problems we look forward to hearing how you get on so um, have a good rest of the day thanks so much John.